ଯାଇଥିଲି ଅଞ୍ଜି ଦେଖି ଆସିଲି ଫଳ ଉପରେ ମଞ୍ଜି ବାପୁ ଯେତେବେଳେ କେତେବେଳେ କିସ ହବ କେହି କହିପାରିବ ରଣ ମରଣ ବରଷା ଆକୁ ନ କହିବ ପୁରୁଷ ସେତେବେଳେ ନାରୀମାନଙ୍କୁ ପଢିବାର ସୁଯୋଗ ଦିଆଯାଉନଥିଲା ସ୍କୁଲରେ ସେମାନେ କେବେ ପଢି ପାରିନଥିଲେ ମଣିଷରେ ଯେମିତି ଜନ୍ମ ଅଛି ଭାଷାର ସେମିତି ଜନ୍ମ ଅଛି ଭାଷା ମଧ୍ୟ ଧୀରେ ଜନ୍ମ ହୁଏ ପାକଳ ହୁଏ ବୁଢା ହୁଏ ଏବଂ ତାପରେ ମରେ ଦିନକା ମନ୍ଦର ପଇଲା ଖାନ ଭଣ୍ଡା ହେଇଛି କହିଲା ପିଲିକି ଦେଖିନି ମିଲିକି ଦେଖିନି ଖଟ ତଳେ ବନ ମାଳିକି ଦେଖି ଚଇତା ଯାଇକି ଗାଇକି ସାଧୁ ସୁଧ ନିଆଁ ଜଳ ଦଉଛି ମାମୁ ଗୁଡୁ ଧୁ ନ କାହିଁକି ଯେଉଁଠି ପୁଅ ପିଲାମାନେ ଦୁଇ କିଲୋମିଟର ପର୍ଯ୍ୟନ୍ତ ଚାଲି ଚାଲି ଯାଉଥିଲେ ରାତିରେ ସେଠି ପଢିବା ପାଇଁ ସେଠି ସ୍ତ୍ରୀ ଲୋକମାନଙ୍କୁ ପାଠ ପଢିବାର ପ୍ରଶ୍ନ ହିଁ ଉଠୁନଥିଲା ଆମର ଯୋଉ ଆଞ୍ଚଳିକ ଉପଭାଷା ସେଇ ଶବ୍ଦ ଗୁଡାକ ଯେତେବେଳେ ଆମେ ସାହିତ୍ୟକୁ ଆଣିବା ସେତେବେଳେ ସେଇଟା ଆମର ମୂଳ ସାହିତ୍ୟ ହବ ମୂଳ ଭାଷା ହବ ଆମେ ସ୍ୱାଧୀନତା ଆଗର କଥା ଯଦି ଭାବିବା ସେତେବେଳେକାର ଭାଷା ଉତ୍ତରାଞ୍ଚଳର ଭାଷା କି କି ବିଭବ ଭାଷାର ସେ ଲେଖା ହଉ ଅଡିଓ ହଉ ଭିଡ଼ିଓ ହଉ କି କି ଜିନିଷ ସାଇତା ହେଇଛି ଆଉ କି କି ଜିନିଷ ସାଇତା ହେଇନାହିଁ ମୋର ଧାରଣା କିଛି ସାଇତା ହେଇନାହିଁ What it just watched is the trailer of the documentary Nanima that I made last year. The film primarily uses archival footage of interviews that I conducted back in 2014 and 15 with my grandma when uh, she was still with us. The original idea was to document the stories and songs I grew up with. I later realized that the register of the northern dialect of Odia that um, she spoke and is known as Balasoria was a bridge between two worlds, uh, the pre-colonial Eastern India in the 1920s and the successive linguistic changes post-1947 when India became a democratic republic. She was married off when she was about 10 or 12. There was no official record of her date, uh, a birth, nor a formal name um, that she was given. Uh, on one hand, she was born with the Indian Hindu uh, caste privileges. On the other, she came from an extremely poor family that couldn't afford to provide education. There are two things that are very important here. First, she was born with the caste privileges for being Brahmin. Uh, on the other, her family was poor and conservative. Brahmins in South Asia are the Hindu priestly class that have received hereditary uh, social and economic privileges and Um, most have abused that power to historically oppress their neighboring communities, particularly the Dalits, by forcing the latter to do manual work. Um, Brahmin women's bodies were treated as commodities by their family members and women lost their liberty. Many women also became complicit to casteist social norms against others, particularly other women. My grandma's parents married, off, uh, married her off when she was Uh, only 10 or 12 years old. Soon she became a mother and then a few years a uh, young widow. So she did receive some privilege for being born as Brahmin, but also lost uh, many privileges. Her language and worldview were shaped around oral culture. Later in life, she also converted to Mahima Dharma, which is, uh, which, uh, is a revolt against Brahminism and uh, embraced a worldview of treating everyone equally and with mutual respect. She embodied all these complexities in her speech. The lack of modern education-based social contact uh, also played um, an important role and it is reflected very much in how 
she and many of her contemporary women spoke as opposed to how many men with uh, more social and educational capital spoke. All these nuances are vital to languages and need to be documented. Unfortunately, there has been very little effort to document the dialects of different eras and people from different social classes. Some of the researchers I spoke with shared about no or very little audiovisual documentation that is made in my dialect when it came to dialects and languages that are primarily spoken whereas people code switch while writing as it is the case of mine. It is paramount to make audiovisual recordings of speeches. Obviously, I didn't know all these things when I started. I only wanted to listen to my grandmother's stories and songs again. As a Wikimedian, I also wanted to archive and share with the larger world. Um, the knowledge and the wisdom was not mine, but of the society and uh, was rendered by somebody who had relatively less privileges. Obviously, if you're interviewing somebody who is 95 years old, whose memory is also fading fast, there's uh, new fiction within established fiction. Her renditions of folklore were vivid, but also full of newness, and though her songs were su surprisingly untouched. I managed to record all she wanted to share with a span of several months. I had posted a few of the recordings I made publicly and they were received very well. I finally started putting these pieces together for a short documentary and released it on her death anniversary in October last year. I was also recording pronunciations of uh, words and phrases using lingua libre. A good piece of information, I now hold a record of making over 71,000 recordings in Odia, which happens to be the highest on lingua libre. It won't last long, but these are also nuggets of celebration in a Wikimedian's life. Uh, while making these recordings, I realized how different the tonality is from my own speech and that of my grandma's. Most automatic speech recognition or ASR systems are trained with speech data contributed by people like me who are privileged to receive generational privileges that they did not work for, privileges uh, to be privileged to be educated, probably live in, a, in cities. Many are even more privileged like myself for their uh, gender and the list goes on. If uh, we want future speech recognition based solutions to work well, there are two things that we need to ensure. The training data has to be diverse and uh, there has to be community ownership in the process. And I'm referring to intersectionality in diversity and not just token representation. This means many genders, age groups, social, uh, socioeconomic strata and so on, but also the tonality has to be diverse. Meaning speech that is rendered in different moods of a person is better at, as training data as compared to the neutral sounding speech recordings. Keeping that in mind, I realized that I was honored and privileged to have access to extremely valuable speech data. I can't emphasize how important community ownership is in data work. When we use the term community in a loose term, uh, in a loose sense, it could be misleading as different people in a community have different levels of access and privilege. How do we even have the same level of ownership that is inclusive enough? It's a rather complex situation and there is no easy and simple answer to that. We can only make sure that the data collection is a fair process and try to increase the diversity in terms of contributors. If uh, there is a way, one must always try to compensate for labor and find funding sources. Something that is openly licensed and freely distributed at the end doesn't need to, uh, doesn't need to be all donation. It's very critical to acknowledge here that donation in most contexts is a manifestation of prior privileges and many don't have that. That said, openly licensed speech data of community wisdom like oral literature can be a good non-extractive model. Um, it can also be done without risking the interviewee's privacy. We are at an era um, of being both policed and threatened by corporate bill large language models. Communities are losing access to their own bodily data. The hope is by strengthening the community's own data and building free and open source tools, um, we could help balance such skewed proportion to, this, to some extent. In short, there has to be 
consistent check and balance to ensure that the data collection is non-extractive, fair and just, and people uh, whose data is collected is uh, they have uh, full access to the resources that are created using that data. That said, uh, community-led processes are slower and have their own shortcomings, but there is uh, that's for another session. Since I primarily recorded stories and songs, the tonality was different from conversational speech, which itself has a strong international swing. The footage used for Nanima mostly has uh, monologues of narrations and recital uh, of sing songs, all from memory. So using oral storytelling as a source of speech data is also uncommon. I have recently started this initiative to slowly listen to the speech, clean up the audio in a way that retains the natural speech, but only removes or discards uh, highly noisy non-speech audio. Uh, also, each word is transcribed. Transcribed speech, da speech data is uh, the basis of automatic uh, speech recognition trainings. My current process of cleaning up data and creating audio files with transcribed words is a fairly straightforward process. There's a certain degree of simplicity to it too. Uh, it is tedious for sure. Uh, what I have is uncompressed audio or video files which were captured uh, in a lavalier microphone. Um, so the audio that was captured in a lavalier mic uh, obviously has a lot of uh, noise from the surrounding, from the environment, because livelier mics are omnidirectional and hence capture environmental noise in addition to speech. I also recorded many interviews outdoors and one can hear birds chirping and um, broken branches falling. This is uh, the reason archival media uh, processing is a tedious task, as I have less and less time every day to focus on this project and it's progressing very slowly. Um, listening to someone you love and who is not there anymore is also an emotional process. That apart, in order to retain the natural speech, I don't boost the low and high ends of the frequency using uh, equalization. I also consciously and conservatively apply amplify the audio by increasing the volume to a listening level without clipping. Uh, lastly, I remove the hiss or hum or different white noise sounds. It's hard and destructive to remove natural environmental sounds due to the complexity of the sound, uh, such as birth chirping. The, um, the retention of natural speech without any distortion is the key here. Audacity uh, has a wonderful feature to mark audio. You can mark the beginning and end of a word. You can then type the word uh, for the beginning markers. Then you can batch export later. Uh, all these words would be perfectly exported. I chose the lossless WAV format uh, for my audio. It is not only high quality, but also uh, is uh, an open standard. So it keeps the door open to free and open source um, software developers. The batch exporting also exports some of the uh, unwanted files. I generally don't name uh, during my editing process the markers for regions I don't want to use later. So when they get sorted uh, with, within the folder after being exported with numerals or similar automated file names, it's easier to delete these files. So what you end up having is uh, a folder full of words, sometimes, sometimes the same word with different intonations. I try to keep them all. Probably it's okay to delete recordings beyond 10 occurrences of the same word. If I had time, I would add emotion markers say um, a word used in a question and the same word used in an affirmative sentence are pronounced with different intonations. If you have such tagged speech data, it helps build a more sophisticated speech engine. Um, so this was a bit about my intent and workflow behind this, pro this pilot. If you speak a language that is low or medium resourced, I strongly recommend seeing ways to get access to archival media in addition to building a data repository of fresh data. It might mean um, getting permission for archival recordings or even recording interviews with the elders. You don't necessarily need to use Audacity as most modern editing software, uh, audio editing software have an option to add markers with names and bulk export. If you have access to a better tool, that uh, too works. Same goes with licenses. I chose a universal public domain release since it made sense for me uh, and for my workflow. 
Um, you could choose what uh, makes sense for you. There's uh, a range of Creative Commons licenses and your data also doesn't need to be completely open to the public if you fear of exploitation. Many indigenous communities assert data sovereignty and rightly so to avoid potential exploitation by non-native speakers. To make sure that the data remains accessible to the native speakers and they don't have to go through any external paywall. Um, community moderation and vouching are the checks and balances some communities create to ensure that the recorded data is used for the benefit of the community and not just for profit making or anything that goes against the larger good of the community. I'm extremely grateful to my grandma who is no more and uh, was kind enough to agree for the interviews I could make. I also acknowledge my own privileges that came to me through caste and gender, namely socioeconomic privileges, also opportunity to take out the time to um, be able to uh, and afford uh, to explore ideas and pursuing this entire project. There's, um, there's also mistakes that I have made along the way. I remain curious and open to learn and correct myself. I'm leaving my contact details on the screen in case you want to chat more. Um, thank you so much for your time and interest.